My name is Giles Dooley, and I have two great passions. One is photography, the other is food. Fuck. <laughs> I document the impact of conflict around the world, meaning I'm often in new cities and unfamiliar countries. When I'm not taking photographs, I am on the lookout for new and exciting places to eat. Meals cooked from the soul with love and passion. But food means more to me than that. I believe I take a better photograph if I've eaten with the person first. Food is a remedy. It's how friendships are made. I would say when I'm cooking, I can hear my ancestors whispering behind me. <laughs> food is how the world connects and how I connect to the stories I tell. Scotland's west coast has always been a place of distant memories and ancestors wrapped in myth. It was home to my mother's family, the Stuarts, and childhood holidays were spent here. I haven't been in many years, but now, with work travel curtailed, I wanted to take the opportunity to rediscover my roots and find some peace in the solitude of Scotland's wilds. So, in my first stop is the island of Jura. Despite being less than 250 kilometers from Glasgow, this untamed island is one of the wildest places in the country. Located off the west coast, the long and narrow island is known for its soaring mountains, delectable whiskey, a swirling whirlpool, and a local population of just 200 people. If you're looking for a remote location to contemplate life, Jura is the perfect place. The island is only accessible by ferry and has just one pub and one shop. George Orwell described it as an extremely unget attable place. And it was when he lived here in the late 1940s that he wrote 1984. I've been invited to stay with Claire and her family on their estate, which also serves as a hotel. Come on in. Here we go. Beautiful. The island is made up of numerous estates, many of which have started offering boutique accommodation for those wanting relaxed retreats or hunting trips. What an amazing experience growing up here. It's an incredible place to grow up. Somebody told me when I said I was coming to Jura, they said it was a place of, what do they say, eccentrics and mavericks. Oh, really? <laughs> and Orwell was around here, right? Oh, well, was, yep. He uh, wrote 1984 uh, about eight miles up the road. Mm. Yeah. Um, he was rented the house by my grandfather. Amazing. Um, he had the idea before he came here. And he obviously had TB when he got here. So um, my father, for instance, remembered him staying here when his TB was strictly bad and the bonfire they had with burning the sheets, etc. So he stayed in this house as well? He said, yeah, he stayed here, yeah. Okay. So, um, and he would come down and they would, they would check the racing. Yeah, him and my grandfather were very into racing, horse racing. So he would come down and speak to... My grandfather, you know, a Amazing. lot, they got on very well, I think. Um, my grandfather died in 1960, but my um, grandmother was always interviewed about, you know, George Orwell, and, you know, and she was like, well, I just ask him if he needed any more eggs, you know. <laughs> 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 like, I, I didn't Banality have any of... sort of amazing kind of, but, yeah, <laughs> life. It was life, you know. Yeah. Are you all right up there? What do you need, you know? I'm a real geek for things like that. I love, like, staying in houses or being around places where people yeah. wrote things. Yeah. And I'm, a bit, I'm a bit sentimental. Like. Jura attracts a lot of writers, actually. Have you got a copy of 1984? Absolutely. Yeah, do, yeah. Not a first edition, sadly, but yeah. I borrowed it to read yeah. tonight. I've got yeah. it up on the bookshelf. We've got a whole little... I should definitely read that. I'm most excited about cooking with Claire's sister-in-law and Jura native, Lizzie. I'm keen to use and taste some of the incredible local produce. Leave the oven alone. Well, I, I seem to... <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it, Jazz, but he walks a bit like you. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to shit away from the floor, Scott. I know. Oh, no. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> you have to love a kitchen that's also a menagerie for the island's animal waifs and strays. <laughs> well. When I think about having one hand, you can't chop it. I can never cut my other hand. 
On my drive here, I picked up one of my favourite vegetables at a farmer's market, the mysterious spaghetti squash. Do you want to scoop that out? Whose fibres have a pasta-like appearance when roasted. OK, kind of like 200, 210? Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> I'll keep it, I'll swap them over, I'll keep it. I'd also picked up a beautiful shin of wild venison that we were slow cooking to make a ragu. Oh, look oh, at that. Look at that. You're a natural. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Delicious. Oh. <laughs> Beautiful. Great. Tin of anchovies. It's quite, do you want me to reduce this down? Yes. Yeah, yeah so we reduce that okay. down. I love cooking with other people. I never cook with other people. I always cook on my own. And it's nice when it's yeah. not just, you know, necessity and there's somebody, you know, actually enjoying it. Yeah. Feeding people is great. That's what Absolutely. it's all about, isn't it? Someone said the other day, like, don't you find it frustrating you spend hours cooking and then it's all devoured in, like, 45 minutes? No. I'm like, no, no, no I love that. Quite, the worst it. would be they didn't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. finally, That's we added an eye of round, yes. a lesser-known yes. cut of That's venison. Bacon. When I cook, I'm always keen to use every part of the animal. So, yeah, so this is lovely. It's, but it's, she said it's like nobody uses this meat. Look at that marbling. Yeah, so yeah, it's like a connective piece. Absolutely beautiful, yeah. But she said nobody will yeah. ever buy it. <coughs> On this island, deer's a big thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's what we have. We have 5,000 deer and 200 people. Right. So, um, venison is used, yes. <laughs> <laughs> breakfast, lunch and dinner. Uh, breakfast, lunch and dinner, more or less, yeah. And I, I'm guessing you use every part of a deer, though. Yes, we do. We use as much as we possibly can. You can try some venison liver pate if you'd like. Oh, I'd love to try that. OK, it's quite strong. OK, lovely. So I'm just putting some on a little biscuit with a little bit of beetroot relish that I made. Um, it's quite... It is a... Venison liver can be very strong, but it's delicious. Mmm. Really earthy, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's it is. Like it's really, really... It's, it's, yes, it's, it's a completely different taste. Yeah, because, like, chicken liver pate is quite sweet, almost. Yeah. This is, like... Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. That's what you want. That's the, that's the money sh Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> wow. Are we going to put it back in the oven for a while? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I'll do it. I can show you my pouring technique. So I have yeah. to, on something like that, I have to hold it underneath there and then rest it on, on that. Mm -hmm. That's how I have to do. You must have had to relearn so much. I always said I would have nothing adapted, but I would adapt to everything. Right. So my kitchen has nothing adapted. OK. Um, because I don't know when I'm in, like, somebody else's kitchen or doing something. So I learnt my dexterity and being able to manage the pain by cooking. So you, you said cooking was a kind of therapy? This was my occupational therapy. That was therapy. all your occupational therapy. Oh, so wow, by, by okay. cooking again yeah. and pushing myself through all these different barriers, I was able to overcome everything else. I think that's pretty much, we can just leave it. Uh-huh. That's the business. Cheers. Cheers. With a starter of cured meats, pâtés and smoked fish, the main of venison ragu with polenta and spaghetti made from my squash, I was able to give a nod to both my Scottish and Italian grandmothers. Thank you. I had an ulterior motive for visiting Claire and her family. She, along with her business partners, Alicia and Georgina, who joined us for dinner, have created one of the few female-led distilleries in the world. And surprisingly for Scotland, they produce gin, not whiskey. We were making the gin when we started in the little kitchen mm. here and literally the kids would like roll off the school bus and the house would just be full of, <laughs> of, of like, you know, alcohol vapours and, and, we, and it, they were like, oh, mum's making gin again, <laughs> oh god. <laughs> I would never, ever, ever let us do it now. It was so Heath Robinson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it really was, it really was. So where did the idea enough. come from? I mean, what made you first think we're going to make gin? I'd gone for a job at a distillery on Isla, on Isla and, um, for reasons of logistics, I didn't get the job, and I was really cross. And so I was kicking the can up the road, walking the dog, and Ewan, Ali's husband, was painting um, at the time, uh, and he, he just sort of said, oh, sorry you didn't get the job. I was like, no. And he said, you ever thought about making gin? I was like, no. And then, like, toddled on, I was like, do you know? Do you know? And then 
email these two, and literally ten seconds later, yes, yes, <laughs> job I'm done. In. I'm, I'm in. in. Let's I'm do in. it. I'm Let's in. go. Hell yes. <laughs> Hell yes. Well, I guess the three of us, where we live, there's not all the great big job opportunities mm. or anything. So there's, there was very little risk in just trying. So yeah. let's just give it a shot. Now in Scotland, from my youth, your whiskey especially, is quite a male-dominated world. That's what's fascinating about gin, is yeah. it crosses all these demographics. Mm -hmm. So whiskey is predominantly male yeah. in, its, in, the, in, the, in the people that are consuming it. Um, and uh, gin, actually, young, old, male, female. Mm. And do you think, and do you think the kind of people that drink your gin, as women, appreciate women making it? Yes. Yeah, we didn't and think that, that would be a thing. No, we go out to gin events um, on the mainland, and then often it's the younger women that come in, and they specifically say to us, oh, we heard about you, are you really three women? And they just go, it's so inspiring. In Tudor times, it was the women who were doing the distilling. Really? You know? yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. It was the woman's job and she'd be distilling, you know, Edson's, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one for you, one for me. Yeah, and then it somehow or other went male. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, now it's gone everyone. Yeah. Well, no, and, and, and I think if I was to sit in a room and in Scotland I was to choose ten chefs, the chances are 80% of them would be men. Yes, it yeah. would be. Yeah. Yeah. If I was to sit in a, a room with people that do the majority of cooking at home... Oh, God, yeah. Mm. It's going to be at least 80%, uh, yeah. 90% no, elite, women. Uh, yeah. What do you say is the difference between a cook and a chef? Mm. Um, chefs are more arrogant and annoying. And, no, <laughs> no <laughs> I'm kidding. No, because... No, because of that... I get asked that a lot, because a lot of people said to me over the years, why don't you call yourself a chef? And I'm like, because I'm not a chef. Actually. No, because I think, uh, I think that's part of the problem. A cook is um, much more talented. They, have, oh, honestly, they, they can open a fridge and they can know what to do with it. They can be on their own in the kitchen. They don't need a KP. They don't need anyone else backing them up. They can pre present a, a, either a family-style plate of food or an amazingly plated, pretty plate of food. That's what a cook does, I would in say, my opinion. I would say, to add to that, that a cook is more driven by the pleasure of seeing other people enjoy yes. their food. Yes. Whereupon a chef maybe is slightly more about their own mm -hmm. egos and mm -hmm. what I have achieved. Yeah. Which is not to generalise. And they can't sort of... It's like, I can't do this on my own. It's like, you've got five people to feed. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. And then would you I say, need though... someone to wash the pots. Well... <laughs> no. uh, anyway, the food's lovely. <laughs> well done, us. How did you think to put rosemary on ice cream? It's really um, good. Because yeah. I was looking to see what was kind of like outside the back door. <laughs> 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 That's the difference between a cook and a chef. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
without giving away any secrets. Oh, no secrets, but um, honeysuckle and elderflower go in uh, the, and lime flowers. So those, so three wildflowers and then the cultivated roses. We've got Beautiful. rose hips that we pick as well. Um, that's just the one that's gone in last just now. And am I right in thinking that juniper is the one thing that has to be in gin? Yeah. Juniper yeah. and above 37 and a half percent alcohol. And what about juniper? So it grows wild. Okay. Actually, yeah. over the back of that hill there. Okay. Uh, but there aren't many plants. They're heavily browsed by deer and, and other things. It's one of these plants that's got um, separate males and females. So mm -hmm. you only get the cones. They look like berries on the females. Um, but it's under threat on the mainland, the native juniper from a fungal disease. We don't have it here, so we've planted a lot of juniper um, around and about on this side. If the stalks go, does that mean the gin goes? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, it does. It's, and this plant has been around since the Ice Age, but um, it would be catastrophic. Mm. Yeah, if I couldn't have a gin and tonic, it would be. <laughs> 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 It'd be hugely catastrophic. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the office. This is the place of work. Yeah. You got it. Yep. Scotland is famous for its 130 whiskey distilleries. But Scottish gin accounts for 70% of the UK's overall gin production. Obviously when you're when you're cooking, there's a sort of formula of, of sweet, sour, you know, all these different elements. Is there something in gin? Is there something you're kind of looking for? Yes, I mean, you have your like earthy, piney, floral, citrus. Those are the sort mm -hmm. of bits of the flavours. And um, we, we wanted, I guess, a well-balanced gin, but we wanted a good emphasis on the citrus, which is why the lemon thyme was so important. And you'd found old recipes dating mm. back where it was used, mm. maybe probably before lemons and oranges were widely available yeah. in this country, but, and, and then it's got lost somewhere down the line. Mm. So we're now cultivating that indoors, outdoors, polytunnels. But we surprised ourselves, I think, with the roses. So um, Claire's rose garden is amazing, uh, really heavily scented yeah. old roses. And we thought we'd try putting them in, but we were quite wary. Again, mm -hmm. we didn't want it to be an overwhelming flavour. I remember we first yeah. tasted it and it was ah. just like, oh, it's creamy. It was so smooth and not overpoweringly um, yeah. uh, floral. So we put more roses yeah. in than we ever thought, so we had to grow a lot more roses. <laughs> <laughs> but we purposely wanted to create something quite aromatic, something that worked as a good long, tall drink. That was, that was the other thing I was going to ask. Did you sort of practice like putting it with tonics? Yeah, right? water. Everyone, everyone drinks differently, don't they? Any way that you could drink it. We'll <laughs> <try> it. <laughs> so we, we started in the kitchen with a, a, a little sort of taster of, of friends and family with, with basically neat gin, drops of water, and, and notes. And all the notes were like, yes, uh, notes of this and floral tones of that. And by the end, it was just gossip. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what's the most curious thing? What is unusual, Georgina? Sea lettuce. Give them the seaweed. Oh, I want seaweed. You only want a little bit. OK. It's cold, obviously. Yeah. So you might notice it's got a powerful flavour. It's mm. really strong. So that's one of the beauties of it. Quite sustainable for us. We don't need a lot to to make an impact in our gin. This is amazing. So what's this one? You have to guess. Oh, no. <laughs> You've got to learn something. <laughs> so I'm getting mint? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a special mint. But it's, uh, it goes in the box. Well, mint mutates and changes its genetics really so readily. Mint mutated mint. Yeah, so mint is quite specific mm. to, its, to its region. It's going to mm. <laughs> it's slightly petrol flavoured. It is, yeah, it is. Sorry, you get that. that. No, no, really... no, but you're absolutely no, no, right. Yeah, you do. That's yeah. absolutely yeah. spot on. It gives a sort of crispness to it. Mm. Yeah, so, it reminds mm. me of sitting like in a traffic jam in Nairobi. <laughs> I, was, I was hoping for a, like a mojito. <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> On a more serious note, yeah. can I taste the gin? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, let's mm. go. Up to you. Thank you. It needs to be cold, you know, and so usually it'll be lots of ice. But, well, it's um, fucking freezing, in all honesty. <laughs> <laughs> um, and give it a good nose first, like you would a whiskey. Bef but don't drink it neat, just because at 42% you're mostly going to get an alcohol burn. And then I'll add tonic. So this is the Walter Gregor's. Really light. It's a lovely pairing. She uses mint and elderflower. Can I honestly say I've never been so nervous drinking gin in my life? It's like <laughs> the three, three of us. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of jura in a bottle. That's what we wanted to do, basically. It is really, really. I mean, I'm not yeah. just saying it. Yeah. 
We're really but, proud of it. No, but I mean, having been out there walking today, yeah, and knowing this part of the world a little bit, yeah, it is. It is that smell of, of countryside, and that's amazing. Yeah, thanks. We'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so. I mean, honestly, yeah, I know it's tough living on the island, but how incredibly wonderful that you can be making this and literally step yeah. outside. And there's your ingredients. There's your there's the parts that of the story are all there. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I realise that I'll gain little sympathy when I explain that my planned schedule was disrupted by a storm cancelling the ferry. Trapped on an island in a distillery is hardly the worst of fates. Good. You okay, Scruffy? <laughs> You'll be all right with that. Yeah. <laughs> and it also gave me the chance to take the road, only accessible by 4x4, and visit the remote cottage where George Orwell lived. Incredibly, he used to do this journey on a motorbike. This house is as isolated as it gets, which is why George Orwell, suffering from tuberculosis, chose to move here in the late 1940s. And it's here he wrote his dystopian novel, 1984, a book more relevant now than ever. With the storm drawing in, I spend my extra night in the cozy and secluded Otter Cottage, enjoying exactly the sort of peace I came here to find. I feel lucky to be spending so much time in Scotland's wild landscape, but there's been a perception that it hasn't always been welcoming to everyone. So while I'm here, I wanted to meet Zara, who calls herself the hill walking hijabi, to find out how she's challenging that idea. Hi, Dale. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, <laughs> distant greeting. I know, it's like a, a gesture, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I first discovered Zara on Instagram, where she shares her outdoor adventures. When did you start kind of really getting into walking and hiking? Um, so it probably was about 2015, I want to say. Um, so about four or five years ago now. Um, I was going through quite a difficult time. Two of my friends thought I would benefit from kind of getting outdoors and doing a bit of walking. So they decided to take me up Ben Lomond, actually. Okay. <laughs> which Good is start. A I know, which <laughs> is a Monroe, and I've never done any intentional exercise before that. So I really, really struggled the whole way. Um, I wasn't very fit and then I also struggled with a lot of the looks that I was getting so because uh -huh. um, I stood out yeah. being the only kind of woman wearing a hijab, brown women as well so I kind of decided after that it wasn't really for me um, and then it was about a year later I was going through a divorce and again nothing really seemed to help until they took me back out and this time to a smaller hill and that's <laughs> when I realised yeah I actually did quite enjoy it so and then since then I've not looked back. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Sorry, I have to go crab yeah, motion no, on, on fine, slopes. Yeah, no, that's fine, that's <laughs> I mean, you get funny looks. Yeah. I get very funny looks as yeah, well, going imagine. for a walk with no legs. I can imagine, <laughs> I can imagine. I know. And is that, is that changed? I mean, is it something you still feel conscious I, of? No, I still definitely feel that. Um, over the summer, I was doing um, a circuit of three Monroes, mm -hmm. and it's quite sunny, it's quite warm, um, and I was going like quite slow because just because I'm still not that fit and a group of people were going quite fast behind us me and my friends stopped to let them pass usual pleasantries hi hello morning quite warm isn't it I said and the guy looked me up and down and went and said yeah but you're wearing quite a lot kind of thing and I thought well my clothing attire doesn't really change yeah. with the weather so it was just kind of things like that that make you feel a wee bit like you don't belong yeah um, there's, those, there's little things that's making self conscious yeah, again about exactly. it exactly like, and that can lead to the anxiety of trying to get back outdoors because you think, well, what if that happens again or something worse or all the rest of it. So it's your mind starts to overthink, I think, those looks or... So I had um, my accident in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, and it was weird because I think everyone thought I'd stop. Yeah. And everyone thought, that's it. But that was never an option for you. It was not. I mean, it was hard, obviously. I spent 
remember after three months, three months we were in intensive care, nobody thought I'd live. Mm -hmm. And then three months after it, um, that was the first time when they took me to have a shower mm -hmm. and I saw myself in a mirror. Yeah. And I saw my legs missing, my arm and everything, and I started crying. Yeah. And I went to bed and I just thought I just died, wish yeah. I died. Yeah. I didn't want to live. Yeah. And I was told, you're never going to walk, you never yeah. work, yeah. you never do anything. And then the next morning I woke up and I said, actually, I'm not going to think about the things I can't do. Yeah. I'm just going to focus on what I can. Yeah. And actually I'm realizing that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I'm realizing that in some ways there were things that um, I cut out of my life. Mm -hmm. So I used to do a lot of walking. Oh, did you? Okay. And when I got injured, I knew I could never do that again. Mm -hmm. So I shut it out of my life completely. Yeah. Because I had this thing that I only wanted to do things that I could do as well or yeah. better than before I was injured. Okay. So you don't want to struggle while doing anything. Exactly. Yeah. And I would be embarrassed to do it. Yeah. And actually looking at your Instagram mm -hmm. and seeing that joy reminded yeah. me of the joy of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And nice. so I started walking again because of you. Oh, that's amazing. That, that means so much to me. I, I didn't even realize that. Yeah, so that's why I wanted to, to meet you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. That means so much to me. Like, I feel like, you know, there's so many people that can, that I can say that inspired me and stuff like that. And, you know, there's so many people that message me and say, you know, I'm worried about going out for various mm. reasons. And I just think like, Life's too short to be worrying like yeah. that. You know, you wrote about just enjoying it and just, even if you can't climb the highest thing yeah. and all the rest of it. So it yeah. reminded me, so yeah. I, I owe you. I feel like I get a spiritual benefit out of it as well because I'm quite a religious person that I feel like when I'm out there in, the, in this kind of secluded area in the mountains and these kind of amazing sceneries, I believe that God has made all the world and everything in it. And I'm just thinking, that, you know, this is amazing, like it's untouched, it's unfiltered. You know, people talk about the mental benefits and I totally 100% agree that there are mental benefits, but for me, there's so much more that I get out of it. It's the spiritual benefits that yeah. I really, really value as well. It's nice because this trip, yeah, as I say, was, was about, you know, in this difficult time for everyone with COVID and mm -hmm. everything going on, finding, finding some peace and, mm -hmm. and but no, seriously, thank, thanks for the inspiration. Thank you, thanks. Well, thanks for seeing that. I'm glad I can do something positive, just yeah. like you say so. But the next time I fall down a hill, I'll be blaming you as well, so. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> now, it was time to head further up the West Coast and into the remote beauty of the Scottish Highlands. On the way, I had to stop at a place that sells some of the best seafood in the world. It may not look like much, but Oban's Seafood Hut has been visited by the likes of Angelina Jolie and Tilda Swinton. And I wasn't going to let a little Scottish rain put me off. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, I'm how are you doing? So I've heard a lot about this place. I've heard yeah. a lot about the lobster here, the crab here. Well, what else is good? It's local and, you know, we can do whatever you want to buy. Yeah. Well, I'll be honest, I'm going to go and sit in my car and okay. eat some great seafood. Well, on a day of rain, I don't blame you. <laughs> So maybe maybe I can get uh, lobster, we can maybe split it. Sure can, yeah. Well, this one looks a nice one. Yeah, How about perfect. we split that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, beautiful, yeah? beautiful. Okay. What else is good? We can choose a crab and we'll dress it for you as well, if you like. I would love it. They look amazing. That's a damn big crab. Yeah. I had a nightmare about a crab last night, actually. Well, maybe, maybe that's the one. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> when the bats open up at the back here, you can tell that the crab's going to be good inside. Okay. Yeah. I never knew that. Yeah. See at the end of the back. Yeah. The, the back door. Maybe when those are getting ready, I'll yeah. just have a few oysters just to, ah, just to keep me going. Sure. That would be lovely. These are our oysters from Cleveland. So look amazing. The taste of an oyster reflects the environment in which it has grown, and Scotland's cold and fresh waters produce some of the world's tastiest. Oh, it's good. And for the purest taste of the sea, they need to be eaten the day they are harvested. So fresh. So then we're going to see about half nine today. Okay. Half nine, so <laughs> you can taste it. Yeah. Fresh, oh, honestly, I think they're the best oysters I've ever had. Oh, they, are. they are really, really good. So clean and fresh. Sniff my muscles. Sorry. I just had a lobster and crab. Okay. That's great. Lovely. Enjoy that in the car with you. Beautiful. And you've got the muscles. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I'm going to stink a fucking crab. Mm. So good. Wow. 
Mm. I should know where to put my arm. I may have slightly overordered, but honestly, it was the best seafood I've ever had. Mm. And nothing beats the glamour of lobster and chips sat in a Ford Focus in the rain. The Scottish Highlands are home to some of the most beautiful landscapes in the world. And because they remain largely uninhabited, they are some of the most peaceful. Glencoe has been the backdrop to many iconic films. I was heading to the Torridon, Britain's most northerly five-star hotel, and the route I was taking was part of the North Coast 500, one of the most scenic drives in the world. Set against a backdrop of mountains and on the edge of a loch, the Torridon is almost completely self-sufficient in its produce. Chef Paul offered to show me the gardens, where even in the winter, there's an abundance of food, more likely associated with Italy or France than Northern Scotland. Wow, beautiful. This is the kind of chef's dream, right? It is, it is. You're quite north, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. So I think a lot of people wouldn't imagine you could grow enough to supply a kitchen. Absolutely not. The, the polytunnel here on the right-hand side uh, supports us during the winter time. Um, we grow some quite unusual things. We've been experimenting with wasabi. Ah, that's hard to grow. Yeah, it's, uh, it takes two and a half to three years for it to grow. So how much of the produce you use in the kitchen actually you grow yourselves? To be honest, probably about 50 to 60% of it. Wow. Um, anything that's fallen on the ground, for instance, so that's a little bit damaged. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of our own animals here. We have our own cows, uh, pigs, and then the animals themselves will eventually end up on the plate. So That's amazing. <laughs> and are you yeah. choosing the stuff that you want to kind of have for next year, yeah, you're so, kind of thinking way ahead, I guess. Exactly, and that's what we're doing right at this moment in time, is we're, uh, we're planning for next year. So how much of it is you're inspired by what's growing, and how much of it is you grow what you want to have? When I joined here, mm. I got asked, what is your food style? And I said, I need to be here, I need to be surrounded, I need to spend a year seeing what Torridon and the Scottish Highlands and Islands are going to give me, basically. Yeah. I don't want to force anything. So this year for me, being my first year, is about seeing what grows naturally, yep. what grows well. And um, things like the artichokes outside, the apples, pears, the trees, you can't see any anymore because they're, you know, because of the time of the mm. year. But all these trees here were full of plums. We've had them on the menu for the past two months, three months or so. But, you know, as soon as it's ready, we take it and that's it for another year. But that's exciting for a chef, isn't it? To be inspired by what's growing. 100%. We do look to the garden first for everything that goes on the menu. And, you know, you can see it in the chef's faces as well. When they know they've put the seed in the ground, that they've turned over that soil, that they've weeded it, and now they're harvesting it and they're seeing it, you know, and we're taking it out when it's perfect. There is nothing that beats that feeling of when you've actually grown something and you cook it. No. It's no. just like, I don't know what it is, but I get such yeah. a feeling of joy. So we look around us first and then we work our way out to what goes on the plate. Uh, we have a fisherman that are six miles away that give us the lobsters, the langoustines, crab, um, salt that's produced on the Isle of Skye. And, it, you know, the, the food we do is, is very, very simple, but it shows off the products that we produce here in Scotland. But it's great because, I mean, it's, you've got something like very, very high-end, beautiful restaurants, and they're flying stuff in from Japan to Brazil, and it's just not sustainable. Yeah, I think a lot of people who come to the Torridon, they want the venison because they've driven hundreds of miles and they've driven past hundreds of deer yeah. grazing on the mountains, and they want that, they want to see that produce, and they're happy to just have it presented on the plate very simply. Mm. I think too many people try to put too many things on the plate, try to hide things. Yeah. We, we, we do not do that here. It's so nice to be able to celebrate what's actually there. Yeah. So just to our left here, we have um, some leeks, cabbages, kale. Okay. Beautiful. Oh, the colours. And some of the things we'll do with this is simply put on the barbecue. Uh, some of it will serve raw, just with a little bit of vinaigrette. Mm -hmm. It's really, really nice. Um, but that's the thing as well, it's great to be inspired by the seasons. It actually suits the mood, the, the light, yeah. everything kind of comes together. And when it's growing, when it's in season, that's when it's going to taste its best. This is like heaven. Yeah. So these are the quince. Um, 
that time of the year now so we get the chefs in the garden and they'll be down here for a couple of hours just picking these and uh, we'll take them out to the kitchen beautiful wash them off and we'll make quince jelly and quince cheese out of it so we get two products out of one out of it but the perfume when you're cooking these is unbelievable yeah, yeah. i mean the aroma is is amazing um, i love quince jam yeah mm. we'll serve that with uh, with cheese scottish cheese obviously another product which is becoming more and more famous yeah which scottish cheeses uh, we have uh, isle of mull a really nice hard cheese similar ish yeah. to parmesan um, we have one a blue cheese called blue murder Nice. Uh, another right, one, Agatha Christie sort of. Well, wait for this one here. We've got um, one called Minger. <laughs> it smells minging, or it smells nice, depending on if you like strong cheeses. I love it. Yeah. Um, so that's like a nice soft one we use. Some minging blue murder. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the cheese list it, it reads quite unusual, <laughs> but it makes people you know interested. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, I mean, to see this every day, what more inspiration could a chef ask for? Yeah, exactly. I mean, every day, the walk to work, I just look over the lock up the mountains, take a walk down to the garden, and um, without being romantic about it, I just let, I let the surrounding tell me what to do, really. After the best possible build-up to a great meal, I finally got to taste how Paul's passion for the garden inspires his cooking. His food is driven by a simplicity that hides the incredible skills he uses to highlight the produce that he has at his fingertips. Hmm. Thank you. Incredible. But I wanted to find an even more remote spot, and so I decided to follow the road to its end. The rocky geography and strong winds that batter the coast have left just the hardy and those looking for solitude to inhabit this part of the world. As I watched the sunset, where the road reached the sea, I found my moment of peace. Thankfully, there was also the perfect place for dinner. The Giddy Bray, owned and run by Scottish chef Amanda and her Dutch husband, Art. So how come you ended up here? Uh, well, I met my wife about uh, 15 years ago. Did you meet here in Scotland or you met in... No, no, we, had, uh, we met online, that's basically ah. the story. Could you stop telling them about the online? Yes. <laughs> Don't tell them that story. Okay. Not that story. story. <laughs> Not that story. <laughs> no, there is no other story. <laughs> I didn't know he was going to go that far back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's true. We uh, we met on the very unfashionable internet, I guess. So you just Googled handsome Dutch man? Yeah, Googled Grizzly Adams, because that was a crush from when I was a very young age. <laughs> <laughs> I love Grizzly Adams. It was the best show ever. It was. It was amazing. It was wholesome, but it was adventurous. Yeah. And you've got your own Grizzly Adams. Yeah. I, he said his profile picture was quite wild. He was sitting on a mountain in Norway with wild curly hair and a big wild beard. and That's it? That was it. I was like, can you fix stuff? He wrote back, yes. I was like, that's it. <laughs> Can you build things? Amazing. And then you were both just looking for something different to be somewhere remote. I thought it was going to see somewhere warm. Mm. Portugal, yeah. Spain. No, what he said was... Uh, Scotland. Scotland. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on this kind of crazy road trip where I just wanted to find some peace and just drove. And I'm pretty much sure this is the end of the road, right? It yeah. is. The, the only eatery within 10 miles anyway and it's at the best end of the, the times. Road, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and, yeah. And so how did you two end up at the end of the road? We were fairly ambitious because, and to be quite yes. honest, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have, you know, no idea really what we were... It wasn't like something we had really worked out. It was mm. just you kind of fell in love with it and went, yeah. right, OK, Grizzly, you can build stuff, right? <laughs> 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 and I yeah. can cook. OK, well, perfect. Well, I'm going to sit down and have something to eat. What's your Please recommendation? Do. 
Um, I think that you should really have the scallops, which are hand dyed locally. Really? Storn away black pudding, which is just amazing. And then I would definitely recommend our Highland wild venison steaks. Mm. These are the signature dishes that we do in the restaurant. That sounds like heaven for me. I don't normally have venison twice in a day, but it's what's available, local and fresh, so it's perfect. But first, some hand-dived scallops and black pudding. There you are. Enjoy your scallops and black pudding, sir. Beautiful, thank you. Enjoy. They're amazing. What else is, is available here? What else gets caught around here? Um, Loch Torridon is very famous for its langoustines, which uh, provides Paris and, uh, and Madrid. You know, it's one of the really interesting things about this whole story is that you can be in Glasgow and Edinburgh, people are going hungry, mm -hmm. and yet around is some of the greatest food produce in the world. But yes. so many of it goes to Spain and so much to like, other but countries. The, 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 we don't appreciate it. The people in Britain really don't want to eat things with bones or heads and you know they want it to be basically a chicken breast is mm. what they want to eat there you are sir one amazing. venison steak with sweet potato chips that looks amazing thank you thank you enjoy your dinner due to a lack of natural predators scotland has an overpopulation of deer an estimated one million which is causing environmental problems such as an overgrazing of forests preventing them from regenerating and impeding tree planting projects. Is everything all right for you? It's delicious. Thank you. So, is juniper and rowan berry? Yes. Where do you get those from? Uh, they're from the front garden, really? the rowan berries, yes. And the juniper berries, well, they're not from our front garden, but the rowan, and there's also a, a background of red currant jelly, mm. which all comes from Nikki's Croft up Beautiful. the hill as well. Yeah. You know what I love is there's the new thing a returning thing, should I say, with Scottish food. We're taking local ingredients, taking local produce. It's really exciting to, mm. I, I love it because, I mean, I've been in catering all my life, but coming back to Scotland sort of 15 years, or not 10 years ago, and discovering that this was what was happening was just, it was really joyful. And it's great because notoriously there's that kind of old school thought that nothing will grow here except grass and sheep. Mm. And it's just not true. You, can, you know, you have to work with the soil and the land. I don't have chicken and beef on the menu because they're easy options in a lot of ways. But what we like to do is the venison because that just feels more natural to this area. Mm -hmm. Over dessert, we're joined by local crofter, Nikki, who, like the Torrenden, grows ingredients you'd never imagine finding this far north. We're having Cranachan, a traditional Scottish dessert of oats, cream, whiskey and fruit. Mm, that smells so good. Including some of Nikki's produce. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I'm just digging in. Please do. Please do. Sorry about this. I hope you like it. I really do. I'm a little bit nervous. It's fucking good. <sighs> Talk amongst yourselves because I'm in my own little heaven right now. Oh, bless. Oh, the cinnamon really worked. I make one with my little crossover of Somerset. I make it with Calvados, I make it with cider brandy, which we have in Somerset. So for me, making Cranachan in Somerset, using the local brandy is much more authentic, actually, yes. than using whiskey that's absolutely, not local. Absolutely, absolutely. Because originally it was about local things and what absolutely. was there. Absolutely. That's what Cranachan used to be. You used to use what you had too much of yeah. and, and make it into yeah. a pudding. It's abundance. And I've been told you're the fruit lady. Oh yes, I'm the fruit lady, yes. The fruit some, some of the stuff I had Tonight, mm -hmm. with stuff you've grown, yeah. or what, what do you For grow? For sure, it, it, uh, I grow it just up on the hill here. Um, we grow uh, mostly soft fruits, loganberries, blueberries, gooseberries, uh, all sorts of Black currants, yeah. red currants. White, White currants, currants, yeah. Because I think a lot of people would be kind of surprised this far up north, it's pretty like stormy, difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think people would think soft fruit's quite delicate. Oh, it's, well, it's not the case because we have, we have very thin soil, but it's also very um, rich soil. And also the sun just burns into this small bay and it creates a little bowl um, of sunshine. So we're on the West Coast and it is actually, the temperatures are really, really good here and we get a lot of rain. So a lot of the soft fruits, they want lots of moisture, they want rain and they want nutrition. 
But don't forget, do you know how long our days are here in yes. the middle of summer? About 30 minutes? No. No, I'm joking. They're Three really in the morning really until about midnight. Yes. So when we took over this croft, we did an experimental bet. The fruit just was incredible immediately. And then we looked around at all the croft gardens and every single croft house has a wee vegetable patch and a wee fruit garden. And we copied what they, what they grew because that's the easiest thing to see. You say it grows there, it fed the crofter. We'll do the same. Can I just say that on this whole trip, one of the things that's been the most really moving actually for me is the women that we've met talk so passionately about the produce near them mm. and what grows near them and following those traditions that mm. maybe have been missed a generation or, or have been a little bit lost mm -hmm. and really bring them back. And, and to hear you yeah, talk with that passion mm -hmm. about fruit and growing it here mm -hmm. is, is yeah, well, it's, it's It's also a real treat to not have to package it so it just comes off the bush and it goes straight into their food. And, and it doesn't have to be packaged. And, and no. then you don't have to do all those things where you kind of slow its ripening down. It's literally, it's from the sun mm. and straight onto the table. For me, nothing beats a fried egg and fresh coffee for breakfast, especially with a groggy head from last night's whiskey. Throughout this trip, I'd been picking up the elements to what I hoped would be the perfect version. A duck egg, lamb fat, an idea from Lebanon, and a copy of the famous Alice Waters Iron Forged Egg Spoon. Sitting by the sea in the remotest of landscapes, nothing could have made the simplest of dishes more perfect. My mother was a Cockney jock, somebody born in East London to Scottish parents. And now I'm back in my hometown to meet a new generation of Scots who are making their mark on the diverse and exciting London food scene. And where better to start than at Denny's, home of the famous Haggis Toasty. Hi Giles. Particularly busy this morning for 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> the rain definitely lends itself to comfort food. Yeah. What inspired you to do this down here? Uh, so I grew up in the northeast of Scotland and my mum had a cafe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I grew up pretty much like above the cafe, in there every day, um, uh, working with food and people. So after a quick stint in advertising in London, I sort of realised I missed the hospitality industry yeah. and decided to jump on this sort of street food bandwagon. Mm -hmm. We decided it should be Scottish the food that yeah. I celebrate. Yeah, I mean, doing street food markets um, to begin with, Scottish was a bit of a hard sell because yeah. it's not as glamorous, it's not as exciting as some amazing new dumplings or noodles, but um, yeah, it can create a delicious sandwich. Tell me about your haggis. The haggis toasty, the Macbeth is our hero product. That's what everyone knows us for. Yep. We have the veggie alternative with uh, the Lady Macbeth. Mm -hmm. um, not meant to be sexist in any way. Because Lady Macbeth was actually more scary. Exactly. She's the one that like <laughs> would have blood on her hands. So yeah. it's actually ironic that it's yeah. vegetarian. For a chef, it's a fantastic product. Yeah. It works with everything. The flavors of, you know, cheese or fat or mm -hmm. fruit or spice all yeah. lend itself or really scallops. well. Or scallops, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. You can't go wrong with mm -hmm. a bit of a scallops and a haggis. We use McSween's Haggis of Edinburgh. Okay. It's got a fantastic flavor. They've been producing it for years mm. and it comes down every week from Edinburgh. Um, we get a, a delivery of uh, like about 100 kilos. 100 kilos of haggis, so that's like a big delivery. Yeah, yeah, you don't even want to know what happens at Burns now. <laughs> <laughs> so when we came indoors, it gave us like an opportunity to expand on some of the, the Scottish ideas that we've we'd been plugging away mm. at, but didn't have the opportunity on, on the street. So we got square sausage coming down from Scotland. We make our own tatty scones. We throw them on with our, our full fry breakfast. And the square sausage we do in a Bonnie Johnny bat, which is going to be the square sausage with melted cheese on top, an egg, some uh, spicy tomato chutney, a little bit of mustard mayo, and then in a toasted bat just to, you know, satisfy your hunger. <laughs> that sounds perfect. Let me get this sandwich yeah, yeah. on for you. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I really love about Scotland is for me, it's always been about women and food. Scottish women, to me, are incredibly strong. I mean, obviously that's my, my mother's influence. Yeah. But over the years, I think cooking generally has been hijacked by men. Well, I mean, I started this business as a 25-year-old 
girl, really. I was just so, you know, enthused to get out there, you know, come rain or shine. And I guess I get that ethos for my mom as well. She mm. had a cafe for 13 years, which she ran herself. Um, my dad did help out, but it was very much her restaurant. Her mother, my granny, she actually was a female greengrocer okay. in Aberdeenshire. Um, so she started the business when um, her husband was at war back in the 1940s. So for me, it goes without saying that women can do it. They can do it just as well, if not better. My next stop is Mac and Wild in Fitzrovia. Son of a Scottish butcher, Andy Waugh had started his business with a market stall in London, selling Scottish produce. The stall next to him was Deanie's, as Andy calls them, the Scottish food mafia. Now, with restaurateur Callum McKinnon, he has two restaurants in the city and an online butcher's. I was picking up some venison from him that had been brought down from Scotland that day. I've got a loin of venison, or a, what we would call the, at Mackinac, we call it a chateau. So it's effectively the sirloin, uh, which comes off the saddle. Wow, the color on that. I always think it looks like a fish. Yeah. And then this is the, this is what, the, the fillet, mm -hmm. so yeah. that would be effectively the fillet, but it's so small. So I don't know if you know what a fillet of beef looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's usually about this size. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's yeah, that's the what we call the tenderloin, but it's, it's not really, it's really tender. Yeah, and that's just the underneath. It's it's delicious. So yeah, so my um, family are butchers, so they all, they butcher only wild meat. They don't do anything farmed. So it's lots of like deer and rabbits mm -hmm. and pigeons and grouse and whatever. But red deer is their kind of the business. They're they're actually a bit of a not a, a problem, but there are way too many deer in the land, yeah. like way, way too many. Because we got rid of the bears and the wolves, they were like a keystone kind of mm. um, species. So they would keep numbers down. And I don't know if you've seen any of the stuff that's happening in Yellowstone. Yeah. And, and they've reintroduced wolves there. It's just like, it's fascinating mm. how, how the whole ecosystem benefits from what we would class as like quite a cruel existence. Yeah, like, but it's a balance, isn't it? The yeah, fact is the deer are still there and they have to be managed. And it's not to be it's for the greater good of, of everyone but a lot of people a lot of estate owners want to have an estate with thousands of deer they want to be like you know driving up and have you know this what they think is like some sort of paradise yeah. but actually we need to get them right down so that you don't see them everywhere and that you've got all this amazing new saplings can grow and see this kind of new Scotland I didn't eat meat for 20 years wow. and when I got injured in Afghanistan I couldn't eat for three months because I had tubes here. There were three months I had no food. It was just fed in by tubes. When they took all the tubes out, my sister's there and she goes, like, what do you want to eat? And I was like, get me a fucking steak. And she just laughed and she said, what do you want, like tofu burger? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. No, it's a steak, don't bother cooking it. Just get me a steak. And it was just my body was craving it, absolutely craving having, having that meat. But now I'm eating meat again, but it's very different because I can come to places like this and choose good quality produce from, you know, wild animal, and, and something that is, yeah, you understand its life as opposed to some mass slaughterhouses. When I opened this Mac and Wild, first of all, people would complain if we'd run out of venison. We've got TripAdvisor reviews saying, <laughs> how dare you run out of your specialist subject? You're a London restaurant. You cannot afford to be doing this. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, these things are shot at the top of a bloody mountain. And not only are they just shot, but it, like, they, it takes you like half a day to shoot one deer. And you are in the middle of nowhere. Once you've shot it, you've got to get it back down to the larder, which is, probably an hour's drive plus a drag. Just the work that goes into getting one deer mm. is mad. But it's, it, people just don't appreciate it. When I travel, I see the balance. People live with a goat, and the goat is part of the family. Mm. And then at one point it's killed and they, they eat it. But it, there's a sort of husbandry, a balance that's part of nature, it's part of life that's gone on for, for thousands of years. That's what's been lost when you get the mass production of it. You know. People are just used to getting like avocados. Oh man. 24-7, 365 days a year. Or I have this, this hatred of like prawn sandwiches. The fact you can go into like any garage, anywhere in the world, at any point and just get a prawn sandwich. You just expect that. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we try a whiskey? Oh yeah. The restaurant also stocks some of Scotland's finest whiskies. And for the sake of research, it seemed rude not to sample a few. 
I'm gonna pull out a couple which I would say are pretty fantastic. You like heavy peated? Yeah, yeah. And this one is the world's peatiest whiskey. Uh, it's got 169 ppm, so that is parts per million of smoke or peat. Okay. It's in. And then this, so you know, obviously, know Lafroy, yep. but this quarter cast, because basically it's a, a cast that's a quarter of the size, so there's more contact per okay, litre well, of yeah. water. So they have serious, like, fruity flavours in there. And then, yeah, our bag is like an you know, ashtray yeah. being smashed over your face. And oh, that's a great description, though. It's like an ashtray being smashed in your face. <laughs> And you know, if you have that... Well, why does that make me want to try it? I know, but it does. <laughs> the next day, I was meeting Ashley Abadili, executive chef at the new Nomad Hotel in London. Having recently relocated from the States, she was just discovering and loving Scottish produce. I was bringing the venison for her signature tartare, but also wanted to introduce her to Lusa Gin and Haggis. So is this the first time you've really come across Scottish produce? Yeah, absolutely. What do you want to do with it? You know, we have a pork dish as well, and when you're planning, you're like, think about pork being in the wild. Like, what are they eating? Where are they Where are they growing? What's the weather like? And then, so for this, it's like you're getting everything that, ideally, the venison would eat yep. uh, and be in the wild, but now we've just put it on the plate in a slightly different form that it should taste relative to Amazing. It. So this, we just did really nice finishing oil mm -hmm. from Greece, and then we're going to use a little bit of raw shallot. The meat's really soft, mm -hmm. so you don't have to worry about it being... That olive oil is amazing. Mm -hmm. Grassy, green. You should also try the gin. Oh yeah, we definitely oh, yeah. should try the gin at this point. I'm ready for gin. It's good breakfast gin. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Wow, they have one, just one gin. That's all they do. Yep. This is delicious. I don't know how this is gonna turn out. No, but that's the fun, right? <laughs> I have no idea. It should be the perfect match because everything comes from where the deer would naturally be. Use these beautiful berries. And then with the sorrel, really bright and vibrant. Mm -hmm. And I like to hit it with a little bit of horseradish. Mm. And then we go right into these beautiful sesame lavash crackers. Yeah, so the cracker's nice and sesame, poppy seed. Mm -hmm. And then when you open it up, you get that nice red fruit underneath. The berries. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I wanted it until we did it, and I wanted more. Mm. So you keep talking, I'm just gonna keep eating. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Example. Just a fine wrap job here, you know? It's easy to open. It's a Scottish technique, you know, it's a, this is the traditional way of wrapping. Close your eyes? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, this is the way. Mm. That's a little fat side of the render down. Mm -hmm. More lime flavor. Mm. And it's actually yeah. quite a light. Very light and the texture's nice yep. and soft. I'm half Lebanese. Mm. And it reminds me of a dish, hashwi, mm -hmm. or kibe, but not fried. They do a baked kibe yes. with um, ground lamb and rice. And there's spices in it as well. This is really nice. And it's a great use. I mean, it's like, it's the lungs. Yeah. Which nobody really uses. Let's do it. I actually want to get a fried egg. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And I've been searching to make the perfect fried egg. Okay. Just so, the egg itself or what comes with just it? Just because I love a fried egg. Okay. Like, for me, fried egg on toast. Yeah. It's perfect. I'm actually just going to go right in there. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, this is the first ever haggis pancake. Yes. Welcome to the world of haggis. <laughs> when I was growing up, fine dining meant going to a French restaurant. Sauces and techniques ruled the kitchen. But the thing I love most about food is when a chef respects the produce and celebrates it in the simplest way. And to be honest, when it comes to the best of Scottish seafood, I'm as happy sat enjoying it in my car 
as in the grandeur of a five-star hotel. The trip through Scotland and its produce has reminded me that it's amongst the world's best. And whilst I've enjoyed the search for solitude, turned into this weird gorilla snot. <laughs> I've realized I'm happiest at a shared table. <laughs>